But this morning and tonight, there's a, there's a parable that Jesus tells us, explained to, the, to a group of people and then application to us now 2,000 plus years later. The story of, I would say, the love of the Father, and it's a familiar parable, familiar story. It's a story, the account of the prodigal son. Tonight we'll look at a couple different aspects, but this morning I want to look at the love of the Father. The Bible, sometimes in Scripture, talks about, in relation to God our Heavenly Father, in comparison to earthly fathers, it says something like this, if your earthly father will give you good gifts, how much more so will your Heavenly Father do that? And I can relate to that. As a dad, as a father, I love to give gifts to my children. Growing up, my dad, I could tell, loved to give gifts to us. It's something that dads do. They show love in certain ways, and one way is to, is to show gifts and to shower gifts on the kids. And I just got back at a great time, uh, a challenging time in California with a spiritual leadership conference, went with the staff guys. And every time I travel, I do my best to bring back some surprises for the kids. It's so that they are glad I come home. And when I come home, they come and hug me, and then it's the second question, did you bring surprises? And normally we ask our kids, you know, don't ask for things, you know, that's selfish, but try to bring home surprises. And, and, and I was kind of proud of myself on this trip. I, I packed a couple of things and found a couple of things that I couldn't always get. In fact, Thursday morning on the way out, we stopped at a Krispy Kreme donut shop. The sign was on, so they gave us, you know, Brother Goldman's a Krispy Kreme donut, and then I bought two dozen Krispy Kremes, and I packed in my suitcase Wrapped them in a bag. When I got back to Michigan, I was able to pull out the hats of Krispy Kreme and, and two boxes of donuts of Krispy Kreme donuts. All right, there. It's not the same as pulling out the line as they come through the aircraft, but I'm telling you, it's still better than you get at Speedway gas station. <laughs> still, bring and give gifts. The Bible talks about how God likes to do that for His children. That's us. Many that received Him to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even those that believe on His name. The Bible talks about that comparison. He talks about. The protection of the Father throughout Scripture. How our loving Heavenly Father protects us and, and comforts us and, and meets our needs and provides for us all attributes that we can attribute to an earthly father. We're surrounded in this church by wonderful fathers. God, the examples. I'm so thankful for those examples. But today, I want to look at our Heavenly Father and the love of, of, of God Himself. To challenge us, to encourage us, to inspire us, so we look at this story, if you would please, in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse number 11. And he, that's Jesus, said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all. How much did he spend? All of it. What did he have left? Nothing. Nothing. We'll look at that tonight about the younger son, the older son. He spent it all. He wasted every last cent. How? With riotous living. Completely contrary to what the father had raised him to be. Completely contrary, we know that from the end of the, the story with the older son, completely opposite of what he had been trained and what he had been taught his whole life. He took this inheritance and he ran, he wasted every single penny. All of it. Wasted it all. When he had spent all, verse 14, there arose a famine in the land, a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. He did not... He'd not had want before. His whole life, he'd been, had the provision of a father. His whole life, he'd had a home, a shelter over his head. He'd had his basic necessities, and, and beyond that, provided. And he took that inheritance, his half. He wasted it all, and for the first time in his life that we ever could see, he now began to be in want. You now begin to have some needs that weren't fulfilled. His stomach began to hurt. He was hungry. He'd never known hunger like he was about to know in this passage. We'll find out in just a moment that he was with the pigs. He'd never spent time with just the pigs before like he was about to. 
He'd always been able to go home at night to his father and, and his elder brother. But now he begins to be in want. Verse 15, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. Not a father, not family, just a citizen. And, sent him into, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and am before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive. Alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Lord, I thank you for this reflection on you. Lord, we see your grace and your goodness and your kindness in this story. Lord, I pray that this morning you would touch our hearts. Lord, there may be one here who has walked far from you. Lord, may they see your goodness and your love. Lord, there may be one who hurts today. May they be reminded of your compassion. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to look at three attributes of the Father this morning. Three attributes that should encourage us, should help us, as fathers perhaps challenge us as well. But for all of us as Christians, We have a heavenly father. Those who are not saved yet, you can have a heavenly father before this service ends today. When Jesus began this parable, he said a certain man had two sons. I read an interesting interesting thought about this, that because in Jewish history and culture, if you'd read the Bible at all, you might have expected the story to go differently. Throughout Scripture, if you think about this, typically in Scripture, the younger son was the godly son and the elder son was the one that went a different route. It began with Cain and Abel, followed with Esau and Jacob. Then you have Joseph. And you have to wonder if when Jesus started this this parable, this story, that when he said, now the younger son did this, if it maybe caught people by his listeners by surprise. And wait a second. The younger son is the one that's veering off the path. The the younger one is the one that's not following the the way he's supposed to go. And perhaps this this beginning of the story began to shock his listeners. But no doubt, by the time Jesus got done, they were shocked. The truths that, that Jesus presents inside of this particular account and this story, this parable, were uncommon, unheard of, and unnatural. A father is not supposed to react the way that this father reacted, especially not in Jewish culture. He's not supposed to receive one back the way this father did. He's supposed to have certain reactions based on what his son says. And the first thing I see in this particular story is in verse number 12, the kindness of the father. Our God is a kind father, and we see that example right here in verse number 12. The the Bible says, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And then the Bible says this, and he divided them unto them his living. Now there is some question about why the father did this. I could not find a, a solid answer. There is one group of people out there, some group of scholars, that say that this was a common Jewish culture, that someone would ask for his inheritance before the father died. I said, well, that's strange. I've never, ever heard of that before. Inheritance seems to follow someone's passing, not before, but, but some say that. But then there's a whole other group of people that say, no, no way. This was a completely inappropriate request. That for the son to ask this request, that it was completely out of the ordinary and off the charts, it was completely inappropriate. Either way, I noticed a couple things. I first of all noticed that the father acknowledged the request. 
He acknowledged the request. I don't see the father said, what's wrong with you? What are you doing here? Why are you doing this? Why are you asking me this? He acknowledged the request, the kindness of the father. He also, I see, he acquiesced to the request. He divided the inheritance. And the third thing I noticed, he allowed the betrayal. I wonder at what point the father knew his son was going to leave. Was it before he divided the inheritance? Did he see some of the seeds already being planted in his son's heart and life? Did, did, did he wonder, did he say, oh man, if I do this, my son will, is going to go way over here. He's going to go to a far country. He's going to waste all of this. Or was he taken completely off guard? Now, ladies, you tease us fathers. You, you say that we have one-track minds. It's very, very true. You say we can, we can miss a lot. Very, very true. But men are not just dumb. Are, are, are you men? You're not dumb. Pastor Scott's laughing. Maybe Pastor Scott is. We can perceive things when things are about to go south. You see a situation, right, men? Your family's here, like, hey, come with me. Come with me. You perceive that. A, a man, you can perceive going down the road in a car when to, when to change lanes well before the ladies who are driving. Amen? And men, you typically stay on track when you're traveling and, and don't end up in uh, Timbuktu. But men, if you spend time with your, with your children, you know sometimes where their heart's at. You know where they're, where they're leaning, where their inclinations are at. Men, if you don't, you ought to. And no doubt, as we look at the reflection of God in the passage, God knows, God knows what our inclinations are. One of the verses that scares me the most, I think, in Scripture is the one found in Psalms, speaking of the children of Israel. The Bible says this, that God, with the children of Israel, granted their request, but sent leanness to their soul. To think that God would give me just what I want, but know that what he's giving me is now going to hurt my soul. I try to avoid that with my children. If, if they say, Dad, can we eat candy and it's midnight? I'm like, no. Not because I don't love them, but because I don't want to hear them bouncing off the walls at 2 in the morning. Right? When they're young and they're, and they're moving around in, the, in the, little, um, the little rolling, the walker thing with the wheels down there, and they go toward the outlet as a father, you're like, don't touch that. Not because you hate them, but because you don't want them to get electrocuted. And you have to wonder here, where I see the kindness of the father saying, all right, son, I'm going to do this, but I fear it's not going to be good for you. You know that sometimes God allows us to make our own path in spite of his goodness and the scripture and his love. He doesn't laugh. He doesn't mock us. It hurts his heart. I see, first of all, the kindness of the Father, but then second of all, I see the reputation of the Father. If you jump ahead in the story to verse 17, talking about the Son, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough in despair, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my Father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy Son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. When I was studying this passage, this particular concept caught me, and I'd never thought about this before in this way. But he's sitting there, and he's feeding the swine, the, the husks, All right, probably a, a substance of wheat. That's what they had there in the Middle East was wheat. Uh, corn wasn't really discovered until much later on, so it was more like a husks of wheat. And as he's feeding these as he's feeding these swine, he begins to, to figure out that, that what he is consuming and trying to eat and his belly is hurting, is nothing, is not anything to what his, the servants have back home. I begin to realize that the son knew the reputation of the father, that the father supplies for his servants. See what the son said? He said, if I go back home, even my servants, even my father's, my dad's servants, have enough food and extra left over. He knew enough about his father that his father took care of even the servants. The father supplies for the servants. Can I submit something this morning? That God takes care of his own? He takes care of us? We're called different things in the scripture. We're called sons. And Jesus said, you were servants, but now you're friends. But God takes care of us, and he takes care of us abundantly. 
Oh, most of us have wanter lists. Things we want, we don't have quite yet. Saving for, looking at. But we live in a, in a very materialistic culture, don't we? Something is always coming out that's brand new. The newest cell phone, what does it do? It makes phone calls. <laughs> what can you do with it? You can fold it. See those new foldable smartphones? They launched them and now they're all breaking. They say, look at this car. What will it do? It'll drive you everywhere. Oh, this is, this is beautiful. I'm in. Look at this. And this car, it only costs $1 for 4,000 miles. Plus electricity and all this stuff. We live in a very materialistic, and if we're not careful, the lie of the devil comes in and it'll say, listen, God is not good. He doesn't take care of his own. And look, you know, if God really cared about you, you wouldn't be, quote, hungry. But this son who was in the field with the swine said, I know my father, and I know what he does. I know how he takes care of even the servants back home, and they have enough to eat that there's even leftover. I can go back to my father. I see his reputation as he looks, as he supplies for his servants. But I noticed this. Another part that caught me. The father takes chances on others. He believed that if he went back, and if he threw himself at his father's mercy, Lord, or father, make me just a hired servant, that his father would say, yes, right? Did he, did he think the father would reject him or not? No, he thought his fire, father would hire him as a servant. Well, why did he think that his father would hire him who had wasted everything his father had given to him, went off the charts, off the reservation, obviously gone against the wishes of the father, went to a far country. Why did he possibly think that he could come back and be hired as a servant? Can I submit something? Maybe because he'd seen his father take chances on others before. Maybe because he knew that his father would say yes to this. And even in his sorry state, the son knew the reputation of the father. Can I tell you that the Bible gives us a reputation of God? In this Bible, I find out that God loves sinful and wicked people. So much so that the Bible says that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us and he showed us his love through that. Like I shared this morning, that we love him not because we saw God, but because God loved us first, the reputation of the Father. I read the Bible and I see that God gave people chance after chance. Aren't you glad that God's merciful to you and to me? That, that we can make a mistake and in his grace and mercy, he says, okay, my child, the just man falls seven times, yet riseth up again. The reputation of the Father, that the Father gives us wonderful things. He gives us abundantly so many things beyond what we could ask or think. We are blessed people. I look around and I see people who are blessed people. Most of you drove here this morning, probably in one of your two cars. Most of you have enough to go to McDonald's after, after church if you wanted to. And, and, and enough that if you didn't want to order off the dollar menu, you could even order by number. And if they said, do you want the large fry, you could say, why not? I'm not driving. We're blessed people, are we not? The reputation of the Father. And the devil wants to come in and say, listen, you've made too many mistakes. You're too far gone. You're way too in want and hunger. You can't come back. But can I tell you something? God says, you can come home. You can come home. The reputation of the Father, it's a wonderful reputation. Not only do I see the kindness of the Father and the reputation of the Father, but then I see, lastly, the restoration by the Father. The restoration by the Father, verses 22 and through 24, but the Father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive. Again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry. I noticed first of all he was watching to recognize his son. Back a few verses earlier, the, the, son, the story says as the son was coming back, a great way off the father saw him. A great way off the father recognized his son. It leads us to believe that the father was looking for his son to come walking down that road right there. He says, I know the road my son has to travel back down. 
I wonder, I don't know this, but I wonder if maybe the father kept tabs on his son the entire time. It wouldn't be unlike the father to do that. But to know that that's the road my son may be coming down one day, maybe every day he gets up, looks out, looks for someone that resembles his son, and he sees somebody, no, it's just a lady coming. Nope, there's an old man. But one day he got up, he looks down that road, and he sees a familiar form coming down that road. That form wasn't running at this point. He didn't run at all. In fact, the son probably rehearsing his speech in his mind just to say it just right. But the father, from a long way off, from a great distance without any additional aid of binoculars or anything, saw his son coming, and he ran to meet him. He was watching to recognize him. He saw him, he ran to him, and he kissed him. Someone said that this parable should better be known as the parable of the forgiving father. The father's forgiveness is remarkable in light of the disrespect the younger son had shown him. The son left home, unheard of in a society where the father reigned supreme. In other words, Jesus was describing an extreme example of disrespect, and such a son would have been disowned not only by the father, but by the entire society. But that makes the reaction of the father that much more remarkable. The father patiently looks for his son and sees him when he is still afar off. And then the father does something unheard of. Instead of refusing to see his son, which would have been the practice of the day to refuse to see him, he takes the initiative and runs to greet his son. And how does he greet him? He fell on him and kissed him. And while his son is still pouring out his confession, he is planning a welcome home party, the restoration of the father. He watched and recognized his son. He was willing to restore his son. He restored his position with the shoes and his son. He restored his relationship with his son. He restored his son. And then he was waiting to rejoice for his son. End of verse 24, they began to be merry. I love when the Bible understates the obvious. They began to be merry. This father who had been waiting for his son, whose heart was so burdened because he takes running, chucking down the road to meet his son, kills the fatted calf, gets a party going. The Bible stately says, and they began to be merry. They had a glorious celebration. They had a party. No doubt his father's telling everybody, listen, my son, he was dead, he is alive, he was lost, he is found, he is gone, but he's home. I guarantee that everyone around that place knew that the son was home. In a few verses back in, cha- in chapter 15 of Luke, verse number 7, the Bible tells us, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Because God rejoices every time someone comes back to him. Every time. Every time there's a party going on, you say, well, what are you waiting on? It's a good question. The son could have come home at any point. The son didn't have to waste all The son didn't have to spend all. The son didn't have to end up hungry, eating husks with the swine. He could have walked home months, days, who knows, years early. We don't know the time. He could have come home the second day. But he got all the way to the bottom, and then he came home. Can I encourage you, Christian, or unsaved this morning, don't wait till the bottom to come home. Don't wait... Until now, there's in your mind nothing else to do but to come back to God. Come back today. Come back today. The the Father in the story is watching and waiting, just like I believe God, our Heavenly Father, is watching and waiting for us to turn back to Him. How it grieves His heart when He gives us so many blessings and we turn and go into a far country. How it grieves his heart when we have the spiritual blessings and the the spiritual benefits and we turn and say, no, I know who you are, Father. God, I know who you are, but I want to live my life and spend what I have. And he says, okay, okay, I'll let you. But by the way, I'm watching for you. 
I'm waiting. And when you come home, there's going to be a party. The love of the Father. I look at this parable and I think, I'm a terrible father. But I have a wonderful father. And don't let the devil tell you that God's not wonderful. That he's not forgiving, that he's not gracious, because it's just a lie. You may be here today, you may be a Christian. You may need to come back home. The Father's waiting for you. He's ready for you. He'll run to meet you. The Bible says that, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. You take one step there, God's coming. He's coming. You may be here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. The Father wants you to come into the family. We'd love to open the Bible in a few moments and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Would you come home? Love the Father. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the love that God shows toward us. Lord, I ask you'd help us to search our hearts. We'd be honest, Lord. There's no doubt some Christians that need to come back to you today. Lord, some people who have wandered far from you. And Lord, you're ready and waiting to welcome them home. Lord, there may be some today who don't know you as your Savior. Would you touch their heart? I wonder who would say, Pastor, how was your speaking? God spoke to me this morning. God touched my heart. Would you pray for me? God touched me this morning. The Holy Spirit touched my heart. Would you pray for me this morning? Raise my hand. Would you pray for me? God touched my heart this morning. Amen. 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 I wonder if there's one here today who says, you know what, Pastor Howell, as you were speaking, you mentioned about being saved or trusting Christ, and I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. I don't know that if I die today, I'd have a home in heaven. Would you pray for me when you pray with the others? I'm not sure I'm going to be in heaven, but I'd like to be sure. You say, would you pray for me? Amen. Who else? Amen. Oh, Lord, you've seen these hands, and you know the grace that you offer. Lord, may we look to you and recognize your love. Lord, bless this time of invitation in Jesus' name.